I'm Joel Miller. And I'm Jamie Bennett. And this is Bad Books of the Bible. It's a podcast about a collection of books with a curious pedigree and an even stranger legacy. So we left Tobit last time hanging off the existential cliff just by his fingernails with his wife's statement that his acts of charity apparently are counting for nothing or they do count for nothing, which is very reminiscent of Job's wife's, you know, throw down with him, curse God and die. We said also that Tobit doesn't curse God. Yeah. But before we tell you what he does do, <laughs> let's talk about how the book of Tobit was received historically. So by the time of Christ, only a couple hundred years after its writing, this book was very well read and received. In fact, it's in multiple languages wow. very early on. Uh, there, there was even multiple versions in each language. I believe there were something like four in Hebrew, two solid versions in, in Greek, one a little longer than the other. Uh, there was even a third version that is distinct from both of those in Greek, but it only covers maybe, I think it was the sixth through 12th chapter. Hmm. So it's not even the in, entire story. Uh, you find it in Ethiopic. So like th this has, uh, this book was very and well known. Circulation, like in other words, the spread of a book, the numbers of copies that we can find and all of that, that tells us a lot about how popular something was. There, yeah, the, there wasn't yeah. like Amazon rankings back then and there wasn't uh, Rotten Tomatoes. Right. So you found out about how good something was by it circulating through your community. Right. That's how, that's how you got connected to yeah. a book. Yeah. And the fact that it was in multiple languages, even a very old edition in Latin so early on mm -hmm. is strong evidence that it was beloved for sure. And who wouldn't love Tobit, by the way? Yeah, so good. And, and it, it was found, uh, you know, the famous Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. So th these are essentially cave libraries. One of the amazing things of finding the Dead Sea Scrolls was we found scriptural texts that were much older than many scholars even thought that those scriptures existed. Yeah. And there are multiple copies of Tobit among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. Pretty awesome. So the, the, you know, something that circulated that much had some momentum and it wasn't like it just like fizzled. There's like yeah. ongoing appreciation of this book in the, uh, in the ancient period and the medieval period and so on. So we see uh, references in Polycarp and Cyprian in Origen. Oh, yeah. You know, you quoted last time from Augustine um, and Cyprian, uh, like in the medieval period, Bede writes a, writes a commentary on Tobit. Yeah. Uh, Luther appreciated, uh, appreciated the book. And then even on down into the present era, they're still, it's still known. It's still talked about. Not only do you still find it in Bibles, obviously, yeah. that's how we're accessing it and talking about it, but it's even, it even makes its way into popular culture from time to time. There's a passing reference to it in uh, Saul Bellow's The Adventures of Augie March. Sally Vickers wrote a novel called Mrs. Garnet's Angel, which is, yeah. it hangs on the character, uh, it hangs on the story of Tobit. Wow. This is, a, this is a book that has made its way into the cultural yeah. DNA yeah. of of us. You know, I want to, I want to add a few from, from history. I think one of the most interesting ones that I didn't realize until uh, we started scratching the surface of this book was that the council of Carthage in the fifth century, mm -hmm. when it lists old Testament scripture, um, you know, Tobit is listed in there. That was one of, one of the early spots where Tobit is explicitly mentioned and called scripture. Wow. I think Clement of Rome um, quoted Tobit but the way he quoted it was, he said, in the Old Testament, it says. Right. Wow. Um, we, we find a similar thing in the other Clement, Clement of Alexandria. He, he quotes the fasting with prayer is a good thing from Tobit 12. Mm -hmm. And he says the scripture, which says. Right. And it was taken for granted by many of these holy fathers. Uh, and one of my favorite ones was St. Augustine mentions, and I think it was one of his sermons. Uh, he mentioned that this book was read like like he's talking to his audience and he's and he says as you heard in the reading this morning wow and the reading was done um, at a at like a shrine for the martyr theogenies yeah and so he called it to mind and quoted it right on the very day they heard it read in honor of a martyr 
Wow. So the, the roots are very deep uh, in, in the Christian world for Tovit and, and really in the broader Jewish world as well. Yeah. That's amazing to hear it being chosen as the reading on a, on a martyr's uh, uh, yeah. feast day, because what Tobit represents through his suffering is the life of a martyr. He represents yes. the life of a confessor, uh, someone that suffers for their faith. And yeah. in that regard, um, not only is a model for us, but obviously was a model for Christians all along. Yeah. Well, yeah, St. Bede, uh, who is one of the greatest historical commentators on, on Tobit, he just loved the book and he saw it as this beautiful allegory of Christ and the church. And, um, you know, he, he went into more detail than I'm even comfortable going into. But <laughs> one of the things that he said is, that Tobit contains, quote, the greatest mysteries of Christ in the church. Wow, that's amazing. So he saw this book as being bound up with the story, the Christian story that would come much later. And with that allegorical reading that, you know, he was able to do um, in his time with less complication than we sometimes seem to be able to do today. <laughs> um, I think that that makes total sense. When you when you think about the story arc, the, the father sending... Uh, the son to redeem the prize and bring the bride home and all of these yeah. different elements to that story, it says God, the father, God, the son, it says the bride of Christ. It says all of those things. It is like a very uh, deep and, and beautiful story in that regard. And if you read it that way, it's wow. I mean, it's incredible. Absolutely. All right. So we left Tobit in a bad spot. Yeah, we did. No, he, he, he starts off in a bad spot. He's dragged off to Assyria, dragged off to Nineveh. Yep. He, he assumes a position of power, but loses it. Um, he gets it back and then loses it uh, through blindness in the second case. Mm -hmm. And basically he's got nothing. His wife has to go to work in order for them to, you know, pay rent and make groceries. And she basically is given this goat as a gift. He thinks it's stolen. He tells her to send it back. Right. She throws down and she basically says like, who are you to tell me this? You are supposedly mm -hmm. this, you know, holy person and you are, you have been dealt an awful blow. And it, it does not, it does not get said in such a way that you can excuse right. the, uh, the punch here. She is really saying, this is a total failure of, yeah. of you and everything that you stand for. And here we are. Yeah. And so that's what brings back this connection to Job uh, and Job's wife, where she says, curse God and die. Tobit's wife doesn't say that, but yeah. the, it rings the same. It's the same kind of vibe, but Tobit does not curse God. What, Jamie, does Tobit do? Well, before I say that, I want to say that what she was really saying to him is what good is goodness when everything is so bad? Totally. You know, that's that's the thing that she dropped on him. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what she did. Yeah. You may have that very same question. Yeah. You're going through something, you know, in the case of the reader in 190 or, you know, uh, you know, 150 or 30 BC, and the same thing with the reader in 200, BC, uh, 200 AD, those readers are reading it through the lens of a people who are living in a culture that is not, their friend. Yes. And so exactly. they are trying to be good and they are experiencing the bad. Yeah. And so what good is goodness when everything is so bad is the operative question. That is what she hung on. Yeah. No, that, that that's exactly it. And it impacted him deeply. You know, the, the book of Tobit says that he was filled with grief, um, anguish, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in, in one translation in, in his heart. And he, he wept and prayed. Yep wept and prayed. And I, I think that's very powerful because I think anybody who's been alive for, you know, more than a few years <laughs> is, is aware that this life is filled with difficulties. Yeah. Uh, for Christians, one of the things we, one of the resources we have is to turn to God. Yeah. When it seems hopeless uh, is probably the time that we most fervently turn to God. Um, I think that's the natural human impulse Yet we, we see Tobit here, um, he's constantly faithful and constantly turning to God. And yet, I don't know, I almost see in his grief here, 
you know, a real true wrestling with things. It's not like he was faithful and therefore everything was great, even when it wasn't. No, he struggled with that too. Yeah. And I think the content of this prayer is fascinating because here is, here's a prayer that is very uh, oriented towards the history that yeah. the Jewish people have recently experienced in the, at least in the historical setting of the book. Yeah. And, you know, this, this could get tedious uh, potentially, but I think we should just go ahead and read some big chunks of sure. this. Sure. Yeah. Are you, are you good with yeah, that? Yeah, let's do it. You are righteous, O Lord, and all your deeds are just. All your ways are mercy and truth. You judge the world. And now, O Lord, remember me and look favorably upon me. Do not punish me for my sins, for my unwitting offenses, and those that my ancestors committed before you. Before we go on further from that, note that he, to your point just now, he, he is like acknowledging that he's a man of sin. Sure. And what's amazing about that is there's no indication in the book so far that this is a man of sin. This is a man who is righteous in every way, just like Job. Right. And yet here he has the presence of mind and the, the possession of his own spirit well enough to know I'm a sinful person. Yeah. And, and he's, and he, he willingly uh, admits that to the Lord immediately in this and, prayer. And it, yeah. And he asks for mer mercy from God. Right. The way. Exactly. That's it's, I mean, it's, it's a model prayer in that way. And then he turns and now, now you're going to get like the historical sense. And this goes back to something you said in the last episode about the historical context of, of, yes. uh, the land, you know, the, the Jews receiving the land as the blessing and then being taken off the land as, uh, as the curse, he says, you know, at, he talks about his ancestors committing uh, these sins and he says, they sinned against you and disobeyed your commandments. So you gave us over to plunder, exile, and death to become the talk, the byword, and an object of reproach among all the nations among whom you have dispersed us. Yeah. And he could at that point, you know, just leave it there. But instead he comes back to the faithfulness of God and says about that, that God's judgments are true. Yeah. And that the penalty that he's experiencing is just, right. and that's right. amazing. This, this whole theme of sin, exile, return to the land, you know, the cycle uh, yeah. is, is something through throughout scripture. And what I think a lot of what's going on here is it's a people, a people who've been given promises by God. Mm -hmm. Now they're trying to make sense of their current circumstances in light of those promises. Yeah. I mean, it was very confusing too. I mean, these people were promised an eternal kingdom, Yeah, you know, that someone would sit upon David's throne forever and this was taken away. And yet they still somewhere, you know, there were always God's people saying that God was still faithful, right? That this, this scattering, this difficulty, comes in some sense as a result of our sins and that the key to the undoing of this is our personal and corporate repentance. Yeah. And that, that seems to be a, what Tobit's getting at here too. Yeah. One of the things that I love about this prayer too, is this next line that starts off verse six in chapter three. So now deal with me as you will. Mm -hmm. That line reminds me so much of the prayer of Metropolitan Phileret, mm -hmm. where he says that he knows not what to ask for, neither a cross nor consolation. Mm -hmm. There is a beauty in that statement of just deal with me as you will. Yeah. In other words, yeah. your will be done. Whatever, whatever is fitting, whatever is good, whatever, whatever there need, whatever needs to happen, you know better than I do. Yeah. And and he says, deal with me as you will. Right. Now he does have some inkling of what he wants to happen. Sure. And this, this again is Jobin. Instead of cursing God and, and dying, though, he praises God in this prayer and then asks that God yeah. would release him from his distress, that God would actually call him home. Yeah. The difference between the story of Job and the story of Tobit in this regard is this submission that Tobit has to, I don't want to call it his fate, but to God's mercy, right. his submission to God's grace. And, and then saying at the same time, please just make it end. Mm -hmm. Call me home. Yeah. So now it's time to get into another character. We are introducing someone uh, that we haven't met yet in the story. We meet Sarah. 
Who is Sarah, Joel? Sarah, Sarah lives further down the road in uh, uh, Medea or Midia. <laughs> Ekbatana is the name of the city. And the pronunciation that I am offering you right now is rock solid, guaranteed, <laughs> totally accurate. Um, she, well, let me, let's just talk about Sarah's bad luck. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sarah's been married seven times. And any woman who's been married seven times, you might say, has experienced a bout of bad luck. But Sarah's bad luck is exceptionally bad. There's no doubt. Because every one of her husbands, <laughs> on their wedding night has been murdered by a demon named Asmodeus. Now, mm. I, it would be hard to come up with a scenario less great than this, <laughs> you know? Sarah is, from, for all intents and purposes, she is a, presented as a, as a good person, uh, someone entirely undeserving of this horrible fate. Yeah. But she has this demon, and this demon is very interested in knocking off her husbands, and that's what happens. But as you might also guess, this is not really all that believable yeah. to the people around her. Of course. You know, if you have seven husbands die in a row on their wedding night, you might presume that something uh, untoward has been underway. And, and that this person is actually quite bad. If, if this were happening today, I would expect a true crime docu-series to be made. There definitely would be a true crime docu-series <laughs> uh, after a prosecutor had visited her. Uh, yes. And that would have happened long before the docu-series because if you start rap <laughs> racking up bodies like this, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty serious. It's pretty serious. So this is, uh, this is the moment though where Sarah finally gets the, it's like the last straw for Sarah. You know, she might've hit it around groom five or six, but no, it takes till seven. And her <laughs> maid says to her, you are the one who kills your husbands. Ah, like she sees, uh, right. She says, you're the one yeah. doing it. You've already been married to seven husbands and haven't born a single son to them because you are murdering your husbands. Right. And then she turns around and she says, you know, why are you beating me? Basically, why are you beating us? Um, and then she says, go to your husbands. In other words, yeah, go just die. die. Just die. Just die. This is like, you know, if an employee spoke to me that way, I would <laughs> take that pretty seriously. Um, if an employee spoke to me that way, but I had seven bodies to my name at that point. Right. I don't know. This is like a really tricky turn in this story. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah is a very unlucky woman who has reached a point which in a very condensed moment. So like this takes just a few verses. And if you think about it, you're kind of looking at the very same thing Tobit just went through in three chapters. Uh, you're getting from um, you're getting from Sarah in just a few verses, which is to say yeah. you've got great fortune all of it's been stolen and someone is telling you literally just go die. And, yeah. and so that happens in just what three verses in the case of Sarah's story. And there, there's an understandably uh, strong sense of hopelessness total for her. I mean, at, at, after this many, and if you think about it, each one of these times, I know their, their era and their way of approaching marriage is a little different than ours, maybe a little less sentimental, uh, but nonetheless, she has hopes for the future, yep. dreams for a family. These things are unrealized time and time again. Yep. And obviously, if she's finally confronted by someone who works for her, um, there were a lot of whispering for many years. For years, totally. <laughs> Before. So she finally cracks. She finally she cracks. cracks. So just like Tobit, uh, the verse says, you know, on that day, she was grieved in spirit and wept. What happens next? Well, she basically starts contemplating suicide. She starts thinking about ending it all. And she does not want to go through with that due to the shame and embarrassment that that could cost her family. Yeah. She, she you know, and, and thank God for many people who've contemplated suicide. It's, it's the, the loved ones they'll leave behind that gets them you know, many people to contemplate a different path. 
and to find hope. And in in her uh, in her case, she prays, well, I don't want to do this to them, but you know, maybe God can do it for me. Mm-hmm. Right. So she prays to God to kill her instead. And she says, it is better for me not to hang myself, but to pray the Lord that I may die. So here we have two characters yeah. in one passage of scripture, just verses apart, asking God, just end it. Just end it. I think that's the, this is the only time in all of Holy Scripture where yeah. two people pray the same essentially the same prayer, God, kill me. Well, it, yeah, exactly. And and obviously the writer uh, put these next to each other for a reason. Yep. So it, it tells us a number of things, but among them, you know, I think it's important that we, we look at this from the vantage point that no matter how difficult things are in life, uh, the, this story is saying that God hears, you know, that, that, that God can be reached and that and reached out to. Um, in in fact, Saint Augustine commented on uh, Tobit's prayer uh, earlier, and he said, "The prayer of the just man is the key to heaven. The prayer ascends, and God's mercy descends." Mm-hmm. I love and that. this is this is the hope, right? And what a, what a beautiful picture, though. Too. I mean, say that again. Yeah, uh, the yeah. prayer of the just man is the key to heaven. The prayer ascends and God's mercy descends. I mean, that's just a beautiful thing to imagine. It's a beautiful thing to picture. I think that that is true even when that prayer of that just man is, God, take me. You know, it doesn't mean that he's going to answer that prayer in the sure zap. Right. uh, But instead, perhaps he has something better. Yep. Perhaps there's growth and healing and maybe there's more to the story that hasn't been told. Well, and in our case, there's chapters and chapters more, and that's a good thing because we know what happens next. And this is actually one of my, I think this is my favorite segue in the entire Bible. The entire thing is right here. Yeah. Yeah. Verse 16 of chapter three says, at that very moment, the prayers of both of them were heard in the glorious presence of God. Mm. there's a lot to get into in that in one second, but I just want to like focus on the simultaneity of this. Mm -hmm. These two people, Tobit and Sarah pray at the same moment, the same prayer. They are in cities far removed from each other. They don't know each other. Their fates are intertwined as we will soon see, but they do not know each other. They have no connection to each other, except somehow in God's mysterious providence, their lives are about to intersect in an incredible way. And they pray that prayer at the very same moment. And the fact that the scripture says at that very moment, the prayers of both of them were heard in the glorious presence of God is an amazing, amazing thought. Yeah. Yeah. It blows me away every time I read it. Yeah, that that is, that is pretty in, incredible to think about, and it's incredible. You know, said so the Holy Fathers when they when they talk about, well, we'll we'll get into some of this later because uh, some angels get involved in things. But many of the Holy Fathers talk about the prayers of God's people, whether they are in heaven or on earth, and that there is this uh, synchronicity that goes on uh, in the heavenly places with the earthly places. And I think there's no reason to believe that it doesn't also happen here on earth as we join our prayers together from throughout the world. Totally. Well, you have brought to mind the natural place to bring this episode to a close, which is that the prayers of both Tobit and Sarah have been brought before the throne of God. Yeah. They are brought, it so turns, by a particular character who will become an essential character and that is Raphael the archangel one of the angels of the presence of God and I think we should kill it right there and come back to this next week when we see how God answers their prayer how the prayer that ascended now is the the grace and mercy of God is going to descend in the character of Raphael in an incredible way and we'll come back to that next week I'm Jamie Bennett. And I'm Joel Miller. And you've been listening to Bad Books of the Bible.
production of Ancient Faith Radio. Come back next week when we find out what happened with all the money Tobit left in the couch cushions in Medea.